We live in a world where people often seek justice. People want justice. When things are going wrong, they want to see justice served. We live in a world where there's a lot of injustice. Today we're going to be looking at belief number 25 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which deals with Christ's second coming, the second coming of Christ. And when Christ comes again, he is going to bring justice. There's going to be justice, and we're going to learn about that. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church, the grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected. There will be justice. And together with the righteous living, will be glorified and taken to heaven. But the unrighteous will die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy together with the present condition of the world indicates that Christ's coming is near. The time of that event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. Acts 1, Acts 1, 9 through 11 tells us, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is Jesus at his resurrection and his ascension, or actually his ascension. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now listen to this. The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner. So the way he ascended, that's, that's the way he's going to come back. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible. And so the just shall receive their, their reward. The just will receive this great blessing. They will be raised incorruptible. Yes, we live in a world people seeking justice, and justice is going to come. Christ is the one who's going to bring justice to this world. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Christ is going to make all things right. Christ is going to make all things right. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, it tells us, but I... I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, fallen asleep is referring to those who have died. And yes, we have sorrow when someone died. People, people have sorrow when someone died. But the Bible is saying that we are not to sorrow as those that ha have no hope. For if we believe that, that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet of God. And then listen to this. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So there's going to be a resurrection and an ascension of the righteous. Yes, there will be justice. Christ will ultimately be the one to bring justice to this world. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6, concerning the day of the Lord. Paul writes, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. 
For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. See, we have the light of God's word. We have the light of God's word. We have the understanding available to us of prophecy if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We will not walk in darkness. We will not be confused and not recognize the signs of the times. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. And we read here, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Yes, when Jesus comes back, he's going to come with his mighty angels. Look what it says further. Thinking about justice. And ultimately it is God. That brings justice to this earth. And here we are reading about God the Son. And it says in verse 8, In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Yes, he's going, to, he's going to take care of all the wicked, of all the evil, when he comes again. And so this is part of the justice that Christ will bring. This is part of the justice that Christ will bring to this earth. Now, we're going we're gonna to search further on that as we continue studying the fundamental beliefs, but it is ultimately Christ who brings justice. Here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8, we read, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now here I have a, an image here of the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and the little horn of Daniel chapter 8. And, and that little horn power, that little horn kingdom, that little horn king is the son of perdition. There's going to be a falling away. There's going to be great deceptions, great deceptions. There are already deceptions and they're going to increase. And there are going to be those who fall away from the truth before the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we read about this son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now this little horn power, I spoke about, about who that is in my presentation on chapter 24, or rather, on belief number 24, my presentation on belief number 24. So I did a number of presentations on belief number 24. I did a short version, I did a long version on belief number 24, but then I did uh, four installments on additional information on belief number 24. And I speak more about that little horn, that son of perdition there. And I have spoken on him in the past. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And I spoke, and this actually parallels passages in the book of Daniel chapter 7. There are three parallel passages that I had spoken about. And we see that this parallels that the destruction of this little horn is a parallel to what we read about there 
in Daniel chapter 7. And so this little horn, and there will be great deceptions. There will be great deceptions before the second coming of Christ. But God's people who stay true and hold on to his word will understand. Now concerning this chapter and concerning verse 1, we read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 269, it appears that erroneous ideas concerning Paul's teaching about the nearness of Christ's coming were being circulated at the church, at Thessalonica. So there were erroneous ideas about, about Christ's second coming. Now, to correct these misconceptions, Paul wrote the second epistle. Again, concerning uh, verse number two in this chapter, the thought that the coming of the Lord was imminent had been keeping the Thessalonians in a state of continuous alarm. The term is at hand, or uh, it can be translated to stand near, to be impending, or in the form here found, to have arrived, to have set in. Paul had emphasized in his first epistle, as had the Lord in his teachings, that Christians should be living in a state of preparedness for the Lord's return. So he, although he was speaking about people in his day, and, and the Lord did not return, obviously, in Paul's day, but he speaks to them with that idea that it almost sounds like he's speaking to them as though Christ would return then. But what we see here is that Christians of all ages are to be living in a state of preparedness. Because when we are not spiritually living in preparedness for the Lord's return, when we are not living as though the Lord, well, we should always be living as though the Lord is watching us and we should always be living with a readiness for his return. We should always be living that way because what does it mean to be living with a readiness for his return? If a person says, well, he's not returning, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to slack off spiritually. That's a dangerous thing. So we, we should always be living in that kind of preparedness. They are to watch and be ready, but they are never to be so imbued with a sense of the second advent's immediacy as to be in a state of unreasonable agitation. Now, this is from the Bible hub on the, on the word that is translated there in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, to be at hand. We see in the King James uh, Version uh, right down here. This is uh, helps from the Bible. Uh, this is the Greek word here. Anistaken, anistiken, I guess pronounced like that. And here we have, the day of the Lord has come. This is one translation. This is the other, the New King James translation. The day of Christ is at hand. Or we can also see this translation, as that is present, the day. So, so there was some, some concern and, and there was according to the Bible commentary, erroneous ideas. And so Paul was making it clear. Paul was, yes, we are to live in a perpetual state, uh, readiness for the Lord's return, but the Lord wasn't returning in Paul's day. This is from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. And again, what we are seeing here, dealing with 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter two. And what it tells us here, and I'll start reading right over here. He warned Timothy of similar dangers. He warned Timothy of similar dangers. Who warned him? Paul warned him. Paul warned, warned Timothy of similar dangers. Adding that a time was coming when men would turn to fables, closing their ears to the truth. Peter and Jude speak with searing words about those who have forsaken the right way. And John testifies that at the time of his writing, many antichrists have come. The Lord himself urged his followers to be beware of false prophets and predicted that many would be offended. The form of apostasy is not specified, uh, is not specifically defined by Paul at this juncture, but can be inferred from the above mentioned scriptures. This much, however, is clear. Number one, the apostasy is a religious matter, a spiritual rebellion having no prime connection with politics. 
So it is a religious, it is a religious, it is a spiritual matter, ultimately, this, uh, this apostasy that is coming, a great spiritual apostasy. Now, apostasy has existed throughout the ages, throughout the ages, but, there, but as the truth is increased, as God's people reveal the truth, as knowledge increases, as truth and understanding of the prophecy increases, as God's people uh, continue to spread the truth about the three angels' message, well, clearly the devil is going to want to counterfeit that because there's going to be greater and greater amounts of apostasy. Number two, the falling away is still future. Many are going to fall away from the truth. The falling away spoken about here by Paul is still in the future at the time of Paul's writing. Number three, the apostasy was not only to precede the second advent, it would serve as a sign of the nearness of the Lord's return. Hence, the Lord's coming should not be expected without the prior apostasy. There is going to be great apostasy, great apostasy. The prophecy concerning the falling away was partially fulfilled in Paul's day and much more so during the Dark Ages. Yes, there has been apostasy in Paul's day in the Dark Ages, but its complete fulfillment occurs in the days immediately prior to the return of Jesus. So we have to study and know the Word of God. Here we see concerning that man of sin, that is, the man whose distinguishing characteristic is sin. Important textual evidence may be cited for the reading, the man of the lawlessness. This presence of the de definite article indicates that Paul is referring to an enemy about whom he had already spoken to the Thessalonians and that he expects them to know of whom he is writing, that he employs the Greek word for man further indicates a definite person or power. For comment on the identity of that person or power, see on verse 4. Okay. So that man of sin, and I have spoken on him, that is that little horn power. That is that little horn power. That is, that is the papal Roman kingdom. The papal Roman kingdom. The papal power. And again, see previous presentations that I have done on that. Okay, let us continue. Okay, I'm not going to read all that's in these parentheses. This would suggest that the revelation of the man of sin may involve supernatural elements and that his area of operation may be distinctly religious in character. So we're talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition or the son, I'm jumping ahead, or the son of destruction. That is a son destined to destruction. This is another title or designation of the man of sin. Okay, there is only one other place in Scripture where this appellation is used. And there it is applied by the Savior to Judas. Okay, see on John 17, 12. Okay, an apostle, once a companion and equal of the other disciples, but one who so allowed Satan to enter into his heart that he betrayed, the, he betrayed his Lord. So this is a blasphemous, a blasphemous kingdom, a blasphemous king, this, this, this man of sin, the son of perdition, that will clearly, his character will be, again, those who have been studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation know who that man of sin is. They can clearly speak on him and understand him, but he, his character will be revealed to all the world. And it says, that is worshipped. And so it is saying an object of worship, whatever is religiously honored. Paul's words depict an arrogant power, an arrogant power that opposes all competitors in the field of religion and permits no rival to receive the worship he claims for himself. His first letter to the Thessalonians, put that on again. His first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul, Paul wrote of the advent and said, we which are alive and remain unto the Lord, uh, the, unto the coming of the Lord. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. But did Paul wish the Thessalonians to conclude that the day of the Lord was virtually upon them? Evidently, some thus concluded. For in his second letter, he returns to the subject. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, 
as that the day of Christ is at hand. Then he proceeds to describe developments that must take place before the advent. The key development would be a certain falling away. But that falling away, Paul elsewhere explains, would take place largely after his death. And there's some references there. Having outlined for them certain events preceding the advent, he exhorts them to steadfastness for the days ahead. So according to this commentary, Paul wanted to clear up some erroneous misunderstandings. But we see that before the coming of Christ, before the second coming of Christ, there's going to be great apostasy, a great time of spiritual apostasy. There's going to be a falling away. There are many who are going to fall away from the truth. And the man of sin, the son of perdition, that papal king will be clearly revealed, his character to the whole world. Matthew 24, 24 tells us false Christ, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Oh my, there's going to be a lot of deceptions in the last days. And we understand what the Bible says about the last days. People are going to be, uh, as it says here in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Uh, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now you might say, well, there's been these things throughout history, but there's going to be general, there's going to be a general, these are general characteristics that uh, the world is going to be so characterized, the end time world will be so characterized by these things that that's why it's being mentioned here. Yes, we've had some things like this happen throughout history, but it's going to be so rampant in the end times, these characteristics. We see here in Titus 2.13, and it shows us we are to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to live in that hope. We are to live with that mindset. Hebrews 9.28 tells us, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the, earth, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so amen. So this is going to be a worldwide, as we saw, a worldwide second coming of Christ. It's going to be literal, literal. It's going to be visible. It's going to be personal. It's going to be worldwide. Clearly not a secret rapture. The Bible tells us in Malachi 4.5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It'll, it'll be dreadful for those who do not receive and for those who do not accept Christ. They're going to be afraid. But, but God is going to send that end time Elijah. Elijah called the people to make a choice. And we read about that in, in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. And, and it's particularly in verse 21. He called the people to make a choice. Here Matthew 17, 10 to 13. His disciples asked him saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must confer, come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist had that spirit of Elijah. Luke chapter 1, 15 to 17. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. This is talking about John the Baptist. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, that is before Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So John the Baptist had that spirit of power uh, and power of Elijah, which is the Holy Spirit was the one that empowered him. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay. But then we read in Joel, Joel 2.28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and obviously on all flesh who receives Christ. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And we read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary concerning this verse. Peter identified the events on the day of Pentecost as a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. 
prophecy. On the day of Pentecost, there was that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but not on a single individual, as John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, but on a body of believers who are a body, the body of Christ. In Joel 2.23, we read, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the day and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 4, page 495, uh, concerning verse 23 of Joel, we read, Some Adventist expositors, in making the application of this verse to the Christian church, have attached special significance to the literal reading, the teacher of righteousness, inasmuch as the time of the latter rain is also the time of the loud cry. So there's going to be that latter rain. There's going to be that outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is going to fill the people of God to prepare the world for the final harvest. Okay? And they're going to give that loud cry message. And we read of that message, that loud cry message in Revelation 18. They have applied the clause, the teacher of righteousness, to the message of the righteousness of Christ to be given special prominence at this time. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of the Lord, which closes the work of the third angel. Okay, and so this, this Hebrew word, Geshem, frequently denoting a violent shower or a downpour. So, God is going to have a people. God is going to have an end-time church filled with that spirit and that power of Elijah. And just as Elijah called the people to make a choice in his day to get ready and to receive the Lord and make a choice, and John the Baptist prepared, filled with that spirit of Elijah to prepare for the first coming of Jesus Christ, well, there's going to be an end time remnant church filled with that spirit and power of Elijah to give that Elijah message, to give that end time message and to prepare the world for the final harvest and to prepare this world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. There was Elijah, uh, or John the Baptist, filled with the spirit of Elijah to prepare the world for the first coming. There's going to be a body of believers now, the church, unified as the body of Christ, to give that final outcry, that final outcry filled with the Holy Spirit, to give that, that final war warning to call the world to make a choice to get the world ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. The early rain represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, whereas the latter rain represents the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which produces the ripening of the harvest. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked it at its beginning. So the, the church age opened with that outpouring, the, la, the, the former rain, and, the, and the, 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 the gospel work is going to be brought to a close with that latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so here again is that illustration based on that of the Holy Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Just to show this is, these are our months in the center, the Hebrew months around them. And just to, just to indicate here that there was the early rains there, the early rains. And then, so this is the, the Hebrew calendar, the ancient Hebrew calendar and all the things that they, that they considered in their calendar in the Hebrew months. And then you had the latter rain, the late rains to prepare, just as the late rains prepared for the har harvest, so is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of end time believers going to prepare the world, going to, the God is going to use his believers filled with the Holy Spirit to prepare the world for the final harvest. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, 14 to 20, we have that language of a harvest. Yes, there's going to be a harvest of this earth. In Revelation chapter 6, 15 to 17, it tells us, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the, what? The great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Who, who will be able to stand? Those who are sealed with the seal of God, those who are faithful. But these are the unfaithful. These are those who have been deceived. These are those who have fallen into deception. These are those who have received doctrines of devil. It doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor, bond or free. 
um, th they, will, they will be afraid. But those who have received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, those who have been led by the Holy Spirit, will rejoice when Jesus comes again. They will not fear. When he comes in a flame of fire, they're going to be refined by that fire. But those who have not received him, those who have persecuted the people of God, yes, as I said in the beginning, people seek justice. And ultimately, Jesus is going to bring justice. Well, I hope that was a blessing to you, a discussion on belief number 25 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God bless.